Um, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about durable devices here, and um, uh, but specifically what we might learn from them in terms of, of detecting right heart failure, uh, can, and what uh, can we use pharmacologic or temporary mechanical support uh, to determine who's going to develop right heart failure in that population. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures. Uh, so I thought we'd start with a, a real case of a 62-year-old uh, gentleman with a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, big dilated left ventricle, ejection fraction 25%, severe MR. The RV was dilated, uh, but was subjectively quantified as mild to moderate dysfunction, although the TAPSI was normal. There was moderate tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, this patient had a history of polysubstance abuse and was an ongoing smoker and marijuana smoker, so was not currently a transplant candidate at our center had normal renal function, normal liver function. So his uh, initial right heart cath is, is here for you with a blood pressure of 105 over 78, a heart rate of 88, right atrial pressure in the normal range, had a positive hemodynamic Kuzmal sign. PA mean was modestly elevated at 35 with a wedge pressure of 20 and V waves to 26, and we confirmed that with a wedge saturation. Mm. Cardiac output index you can see is exceedingly low with an index of 1.1, and pulmonary vascular resistance was also elevated. And when we look at some of the traditional markers of right heart function, you can see the right atrial pressure to wedge ratio was 0.3 and the PAPI was 3.3, which is generally favorable. We gave this uh, individual nitroprusside, uh, given the elevated pulmonary vascular resistance, uh, you can see blood pressure predict predictably fell. Right atrial pressure actually did not change. Mean pulmonary pressure, wedge pressure declined. Uh, and there was an increase, but only a modest increase in cardiac index. And you can see that the stroke volume index actually remained quite low, and the PAPI actually declined a bit. Now, this patient um, actually was not on any inotropes, and they were intermax profile four. So just by a show of hands, who thinks this person's really very high risk for right heart failure after a durable VAD? Yeah, so really not, right, by traditional, uh, by traditional criteria. So uh, what happened? Uh, we implanted this individual via a less invasive strategy with an anterior thoracotomy. Bypass time was relatively short. There was good cannula position, but there was at least moderate RV dysfunction coming out of the operating room with an elevated CVP and lactate. We required modest dose or moderate doses of inotropes and inhaled nitric oxide. There was some bleeding that occurred, which certainly didn't help, and there was acute kidney injury that resolved without, without dialysis. The patient had a lot of suction events, required uh, pump speed lowering, and a very slow inotrope wean of 16 days. So actually we'll meet the criteria for right heart failure, early right heart failure, which we'll review in a minute. Uh, but there was good recovery. The length of stay was longer than we wanted, 22 days. Uh, but he's out now over a year and actually not on any diuretics. So the question is, could we have predicted right heart failure in this uh, individual? And why is it so hard to predict right heart failure? And really one of the, uh, so what are our options to assess the right ventricle? So traditionally we have our, our Swan-Gans catheter. We can look at that right atrial pressure to wedge ratio. We can look at the PAPI. Certainly Naveen has shown us that. We can look at the right ventricular stroke work index. We can look at echo. We can look at RV size and function, uh, TAPSI, S prime. We can look at the TAPSI to PAPSI ratio, probably the best surrogate for RVPA coupling with echo. We can even get better uh, definity with, uh, with cardiac MRI. But at least in isolation, none of these are very good predictors of who's going to develop RV dysfunction. Now we can also develop a risk score, and this um, was a review from 2017, and don't squint, but there were 29 of them, and I think uh, as of today there's probably about 59, and the problem is none of them actually work very well in independent validation cohorts. You can see here some of these early validation or risk, uh, risk scores are really no better than the flip of a coin. So uh, again, um, probably the largest one that's uh, been developed is the Euromax right heart failure risk score, derived from 2,000 patients, another 1,000 patient uh, validation cohort, identified five factors associated with right heart failure. Again, that right atrial pressure to wedge uh, ratio, a low hemoglobin, multiple inotropes, intermax profile, uh, and then just uh, subjective severe RV dysfunction on echo. But even in this very large cohort, and the derivation cohort, the, the AUC, the C, uh, the C index is only about 0.7. So it's, again, pretty modest discrimination. So what about our patient? What were his risk scores? Well, they were all low, every one of them. And so are there any other clues or ways to unmask RV failure? 
Uh, this is a perspective that we wrote uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and I think it's worth a read if you're confused about right heart failure. If you read it, you'll still be confused about uh, right heart failure, but we'll, you'll be slightly, uh, slightly a higher thinker at, at that point. The, the key theme here is that uh, after implant of a durable LVAD, we have a decline in our septal function. And the septal function is really the lion's share of right ventricular function. And there's a lot of different factors that contribute to this, one of which we was just mentioned, and that is the role of the pericardium. We know that when we incise the pericardium, we lose some of that longitudinal motion and septal function. We also, as we implant these LVEDs at the apex, lose LV twist, which is responsible for some of that septal function. The other uh, key factor here is that we, when we unload the left ventricle, we decrease LV contractility, and we know that the RV depends on the LV for about 50% of its contractility. So when we unload the LV, which is our goal, RV contractility will always actually decline. Uh, and so all of these factors uh, contribute to why we see so much RV failure, not just the state of the RV prior to implantation. So what is the gold standard to assess RV function? Of course, I had to show a pressure volume loop. Uh, and, and this certainly is, um, but if, as okay. St Stephen Hawking once said, pressure volume analysis may be possible, but it's not actually practical. Mm -hmm. And so do we have uh, any uh, less invasive tools that might be helpful? And I'll submit to you that looking at right ventricular reserve, the ability of the right ventricle to increase contractility at a given level of loading with either dobutamine uh, or exercise might be able to do that. This is a uh, animal model of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, when they, uh, they performed pressure volume analysis and then gave these animals dobutamine and looked at changes in stroke volume index. You can see the animals that had the most severe uncoupling had the least increase in stroke volume index uh, with dobutamine, and there was a relatively linear relationship between the gold standard RVPA coupling and stroke volume index reserve with dobutamine. Uh, we've also uh, looked at this uh, and found a, at least a modest correlation between RV ejection fraction during submaximal exercise and resting RVPA coupling. This is data in humans with either known or suspected pulmonary hypertension. What about in the, the VAD world? We really have very limited data. This is a study of six patients. I don't think the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplant would publish six, a six-patient cohort anymore. Uh, six patients that with biventricular failure undergoing dobutamine stress echo prior to MCS implant. And you can see those individuals who did not develop right heart failure uh, had an, a, a more of an increase in systolic pulmonary artery pressure and perhaps an increase in TAPSI compared to those who ultimately developed right heart failure, although certainly there's a lot of overlap here. And so um, one of the problems, though, as we think about our patients who need these durable devices is that many are already on an inotrope and many cannot exercise. So for our purposes, can we define RV reserve a little bit differently? And can we define it as the response of the RV to LV unloading, either with pharmacologic or temporary mechanical support? And so as we think about this, I'll just kind of review some, what I think of as conservation rules, and that's for any given cardiac output, uh, the heart rate of each, each ventricle is the same, and so therefore the stroke volume in the left ventricle must, be, uh, must equal the stroke volume in the right ventricle. So as we, uh, as we reduce systemic vascular resistance and we unload the LV, the LV stroke volume will be limited if the RV stroke volume is also limited. So let me show you what that would look like with pressure volume loops in a patient with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Here, afterload is very high, uh, and there's a low stroke volume. So we give this individual nitroprusside, we reduce LV afterload, and now stroke volume will increase, but only if preload in the LV is actually maintained. On the other hand, if there is no RV reserve, there's no ability of that RV to pump more blood to the LV, preload is not maintained and your stroke volume augmentation is reduced or limited. And so we wanted to study this uh, in patients undergoing uh, LVAD. So this was a retrospective multicenter study at our institution, University of Pennsylvania in Toronto. 70 patients who underwent a right heart catheterization with vasodilator testing with nitroprusside as part of their evaluation for advanced therapies and they ultimately received an LVAD. Most of these patients had an elevated pulmonary vascular resistance, and we defined right heart failure by the 2020 uh, MCS ARC definition, which I reviewed earlier. And then we did a follow-up cohort of 10 consecutive patients. 
First of all, right heart failure was uh, actually quite common uh, in, in, um, in our cohort. 39% of patients actually met criteria for right heart failure. Uh, thankfully, most of those were not at our center. But 20% uh, actually required an RVAD, and half of those were planned. And so actually, that's a really important point as we think about studying right heart failure. Now that we have devices that are easy to put in, uh, we have to think about how that might bias our results. So when we compare the characteristics of those who did and did not develop right heart failure, you can see had very similar baseline demographics uh, and intermax profile. Baseline hemodynamics were essentially the same. Echo parameters, laboratory parameters, and no difference in any of the risk scores that we commonly look at. So what was really different was actually the response of stroke volume index to nitroprusside. So the peak stroke volume index with nitroprusside was actually quite a good discriminator of those who did and did not develop right heart failure and much better than just the baseline stroke volume index. We looked at that more specifically in just the only commercially available device, which was the HeartMate 3, uh, and also in those individuals who had right heart failure but did not require uh, an RVAD because of the potential bias I mentioned. Uh, and they, uh, it also held pretty good uh, with an AUC of around 0.8 in these groups. This is a population pyramid, and it just really highlights that if you could uh, augment your stroke volume index to an absolute value of above 22, uh, the likelihood of right heart failure was actually quite low. So about three days after we published uh, that paper, there was uh, this paper that came out uh, in Europe that was uh, very, very similar, almost like they had reviewed our paper. Uh, but in fact, it actually showed something very similar. So again, looking at differences with nitroprusside in those who did and did not develop right heart failure, uh, you can see differences in stroke volume index during peak nitroprusside infusion, but it was quite additive that they added in PAPI. Uh, so we did not actually have right atrial pressures. And you can see here, uh, and highlighted best in this figure, the individuals who did not develop right heart failure had significant improvements in their PAPI with nitroprusside, whereas those individuals with right heart failure had actually failed to, uh, failed to statistically improve. Uh, another study with a similar concept from the Cleveland Clinic, Matt Gonzalez, uh, looking at not just the baseline parameters, hemodynamic parameters, but actually the optimal ones. So what, what did they look like after they were treated with diuretics, vasodilators, inotropes? Uh, and they found, uh, similar to our study, that it was the, the optimized hemodynamics, the optimal PAPI uh, that was, in fact, the best predictor and additive to more traditional models to predict right heart failure. Well, so we talked about vasodilators and pharmacologic unloading. What about using devices that we all have at our disposal to predict right heart failure? And so this is work uh, from Arvin's group at Methodist, uh, looking at the response of the RV to unloading with, with an impella device. Uh, first here, just showing before and after impella devices uh, that there was really no difference in the Euromax RV risk score. Uh, in those who did, and not, did not develop right heart failure, but they did see significant differences in the hemodynamic response to unloading. And what is essentially shown here is those individuals who had a, a, a significant decrease in their right atrial pressure, those that really did not have an increase in their right atrial pressure to wedge ratio, and those that had an improvement in PAPI were much less likely to develop right heart failure uh, after implantation. So back to our patient, uh, if we look now just really at our nitroprusside data, you can see that the stroke volume index there is actually quite low, and the PAP actually fell. And so perhaps this individual actually had impaired RV reserve, uh, and so perhaps that individual's RV was actually sicker than we gave it credit for, credit for going into implantation. Uh, so to summarize, uh, RV reserve is associated with the gold standard uh, measure of ventricular function. Vasodilator testing or even temporary MCS to unload the LV may be another way to assess RV reserve and predict RV failure in patients undergoing a durable LVAD implantation. And certainly prospective studies are clearly needed to test these hypotheses. Thanks very much.